We often crave to be loved perfectly, yet human love is naturally imperfect. And while it's normal for us to unintentionally let each other down now and again, actions of betrayal are in a different category altogether. The etymology of the word betrayal takes us to its roots of deceit, unfaithfulness, and treachery, all of which remind us of its magnitude. Betrayal, as the antithesis of trust and love, can destroy a relationship that took years to build. Whether we are betrayed by a romantic partner, family member, friend, or other trusted person, betrayal can cut us to the core. Is it possible to fully heal from the pain of betrayal? Today, we'll focus on this listener's real-life question. My family fell apart after my parents died. They were everything to me. Although my parents didn't have much to leave us, my oldest sister and brother betrayed me behind the scenes just to get more for themselves. I feel sick from the betrayal and don't have any contact with them. I feel like I don't have any family left. How can I let this go? And with that question as the focus of today's episode, I'm Dr. Carla Marie Manley, and this is Imperfect Love. Welcome to Imperfect Love with Dr. Carla Marie Manley, psychologist, author, and relationship expert. I'm here to help unravel mysteries and misconceptions about love, relationships, and mental health issues, plus everything in between. Love is complicated, people are not perfect, and relationships surely can be tough. Together, we'll navigate this messy, imperfect space of real life. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Dr. Debbie Silber, who will be sharing her expertise on helping people heal physically, mentally, and emotionally from the pain of betrayal. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Debbie. It is such a joy and a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you for the work you do in helping people heal from the pain mental, physical, emotional, all of that that comes with betrayal. And before we launch into betrayal and responding to the listener's question, can you tell our audience just a little bit about what makes you, you? (laughs) Sure. Well, I've been in business 33 plus years. I don't think anybody says, oh, I think I want to study betrayal. No, you study it because you have to. I was in health and then mindset and personal development. And then I had a painful betrayal from my family thought I did everything I needed to do to heal from that. And then it happened again a few years later. This time it was my husband. Anybody who's been through that, you're shocked, blindsided, devastated. So that was the deal breaker. Got him out of the house and looked at the two experiences thinking, what's similar to these two? Of course, me, but what else? And I realized that I never really took my own needs seriously. Boundaries were always getting crossed. And I'm one of those people that really uh, lives by the idea that if nothing changes, nothing changes. So here he was, four kids, six dogs, a thriving business, and I decided to go back for a PhD to study betrayal, and it was in transpersonal psychology. And while I was there, I did a study, I studied betrayal, and I was honestly just looking to heal. I had no idea this was going to happen, but that study led to three discoveries, which changed my health, my family, my work, my life. So I have a feeling we're going to be talking about those three discoveries. And I, your website, you actively are doing research because there's, I mean, your website's fascinating with lots of tips and tools and information. So yes, a really good place to start. But first, after, after that, let's take a look at, you talk about the five steps, Mm -hmm. the five stages of healing from betrayal. Could you tell us just a little bit about those before we dive into responding to that particular question? And by the way, I didn't know about your family betrayal when I matched you with this particular question, because many people think that betrayal is done by your romantic partner, and they think that that's it. But betrayal can happen in every avenue of life. Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting because when I was doing this study, originally I was studying the betrayal of a family member, a partner, or a friend. I actually had to drop the friend part because while friends will infuriate you, they don't 
break you. Of course, we're never broken, bent, like a family member or a partner. Those are the ones that bring us to our knees. Those are the ones that get us the most. To answer your question though, the five stages, that was the third discovery. You want me to go into that one first? I could go into the first, the second discovery. I can go into all of them. Let's just start with the discoveries in the order that you choose. I think those are wonderful. That's a wonderful place to start. Sure. Okay. So the first discovery was, you know, I had a feeling that betrayal was a different type of trauma. I'd been through death of a loved one. I'd been through disease, but I was like, "Mm, betrayal feels different for me. I didn't want to assume it was the same for all my study participants. So I asked them, if you've been through other traumas, does betrayal feel different for you? And unanimously, they said it was so different. And here's why. Because it feels so intentional, we take it so personally. So the entire self is shattered and has to be rebuilt. Rejection, abandonment, belonging, confidence, worthiness, trust, they're all destroyed and have to be rebuilt. So while originally I was studying betrayal and post-traumatic growth, the sort of the upside of trauma, I was like, you know, Post-traumatic growth, I look at it as the invitation to, to change your life after and rebuild your life after a trauma. But betrayal is rebuilding not just your life, rebuilding yourself as well. So that type of trauma needed and healing needed its own name, which is now called post-betrayal transformation. So that betrayal is a different type of trauma. That was the first discovery. Okay. The second one? Well, before you go into the second one, I really want to pause and commend you or maybe just comment on our alignment in a key piece about betrayal that you captured immediately, which I was going to bring up if you didn't, but you did bring it up. The fact that betrayal is intentional and that's what makes it different. If we have a, an unconscious misstep, we hurt a partner's feelings we, you know, cross a loved one, a family member's boundaries. Those are you know, acts of being an imperfect human. But betrayal, there's treachery, there's deceit, there's planning behind the scenes. There's the knowledge that you are telling a false story or, you know, manipulating someone. All of those, there's whether somebody says, oh, it was unconscious, I didn't mean it. No, there's planning, there's manipulation involved. Absolutely. And to take that even further, you know, think about it. We're sure we can be betrayed by people that we're not that close to. But the reason why betrayal is so shocking and so traumatizing is this was the person or these were the people we trusted the most. Mm -hmm. This was the person, these were the people who gave us a sense of safety and security. So when these are the people to take it away, it is absolutely shocking. That shock lodges itself on our body, our mind, our heart. And it's as if the person takes a mask off and reveals who they've been, where here we are abiding by the rules of that relationship, assuming that the other person, the other people are too. And then without our awareness or consent, someone just decides to do it a different way. And it's absolutely shocking. Absolutely. I agree with you completely because there are implicit rules in relationships, such as respect, honesty, fairness, transparency. We ought not have to double check those. And so many people that I work with and in you know recovering from my own betrayals, you realize that, wait a second, these are common sense. I shouldn't have had to, and I'm not a big should person, but these are some of the foundational rules that when we look, wait, in a relationship, we ought to be able to rely on honesty on integrity, respect, transparency, openness, all of those things. And if somebody's going to do something that could be harmful, then you just say, hey, going to do this, I'm going to, you know, take all the money or have sex with somebody at the office or whatever it is. And then be at least, you know, at least be transparent about it. But that's where the pain of betrayal comes is the lack of transparency the lack of agency for the other person. So, okay. It's the breaking of those spoken or unspoken rules. And think about this too. When you, let's say when you lose someone you love, for example, you grieve, you're sad, you mourn the loss, life will never be the same. You don't necessarily question the whole relationship. 
Mm-hmm. You don't question your ability to trust. You don't question your sanity. With betrayal, you do. It's a very different experience. Beautifully said. Okay. Number two, what was your second discovery? So the second discovery is there's actually a collection of symptoms, physical, mental, and emotional, so common to betrayal, it's known as post-betrayal syndrome. We've had over 95,000 plus people take our post-betrayal syndrome quiz on our site to see to what extent they're struggling. A few things about that. The first thing is we've all been taught time heals all wounds. Well, I have the proof that when it comes to betrayal, that's not true. There's a a question on the quiz that says, is there anything else you'd like to share? And people write things like, my betrayal happened 35 years ago, and I'm unwilling to trust. My betrayal happened 10 years ago. I feel gutted. My betrayal happened 15 years ago. It feels like it happened yesterday. So we know we cannot count on time. We can't even count on a new relationship to heal betrayal. Healing has to be deliberate and intentional. And until and unless we do that, it will follow us around in our work, in our health, in our relationships. But every few months, I pull the stats from the quiz to see where people land, and I'm happy to share them if that would serve. Absolutely. So we'll maybe toward the end, we can share some highlights of what the quiz shows, or would you like to do that now? We, I mean, we're talking about it, so we can do okay, this. Okay, let's share. It'll, it'll actually, it'll actually uh, make the third discovery make so much more mm, sense. Good, okay. So, yeah. So I'm going to share some of these statistics. As much as I'm going to share the symptoms, everybody really should pay attention to these numbers because they are so high. Ready? Now imagine out of 95,000 plus people, 78% constantly revisit their experience. 81% feels a loss of personal power. 80% are hypervigilant. 94% deal with painful triggers. And if you've ever had a trigger, they're brutal. The most common physical symptoms, 71% have low energy. 68% have sleep issues. 63% have extreme fatigue. You sleep all night, you wake up, you're exhausted. Your adrenals have crashed. have weight changes. So in the beginning, maybe you can't even hold food down. Later on, you're emotionally eating. 45% have a digestive issue. That could be anything. Crohn's, IBS, diverticulitis, you name it. The most common mental symptoms. 78% are overwhelmed. 68% can't focus. 62% can't concentrate. So let's just stop there. You can't concentrate. You have a gut issue. You're exhausted. You still have to work. Mm -hmm. You still have to raise your kids. That's not even emotionally. Emotionally, 88% experienced extreme sadness. 83% are very angry. You can bounce back and forth between those two all day. 79% are stressed. I'm skipping so many of them, just a few more. This one got me. 84% have an inability to trust. Mm -hmm. Think about how that would impact everything you do. 67% prevent themselves from forming deep relationships because they're afraid of being hurt again. 82% find it hard to move forward. 90% want to move forward, but they don't know how. And just to finish off with that, what's even more staggering is those stats aren't even necessarily from a recent betrayal. That could be from the parent who did something awful when you were a kid. That could be from the girlfriend or boyfriend who broke your heart in high school. So think about this. That person may not know, care, remember, they may not even be alive. And here we are decades later with those symptoms because it's left unhealed. The good news is we can heal from all of it, which was the third discovery. But before we get into that, if you have any questions about this one. I think that those statistics are extremely illuminating and they're not surprising because as we both work with clients and groups, we see that betrayal is haunting. And I agree with you. And I actually talk about this quite a bit in my fourth book, The Joy of Imperfect Love, how people, that the idea that time heal all wounds causes so many problems because people think, I'm not bringing this into my relationship. It's from my childhood. I'm not taking this into my third or second or first marriage. It's from a prior relationship. No, every injury, every betrayal, whether it was a theft, whether it was a lie to you, whether whatever it was, those stay in the body, mind, and spirit until they are given conscious attention 
until they are healed. And I look at them much like a physical wound. If you have, you know, BB stuck inside your body, it's going to fester and that wound will just get worse until you, you know, open up the wound, take it out very carefully, clean it and allow it to heal. And I agree with you. It's the same with betrayal and possibly betrayal is one of the most difficult wounds to heal from because it does take us down to that foundation. We look at Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs, that safety and security, that foundation that we all need to be able to function, that foundation, big earthquake to it, it is in pieces. And then as you say, people are expected to carry on with their lives. All the while, often the person who's betrayed the other person or the people who have done the betrayal, they're saying, oh, it's your problem. Mm. You know, you're the problem. You're too sensitive or you're not playing by our rules. And so the person is often really left questioning themselves. And when it comes to physical betrayal, often the betraying person says, well, you weren't keeping yourself up or this other person was sexy or you weren't giving me enough sex or whatever it is. And all of those excuses are just that, they're excuses, because there is no excuse for betrayal. Mm -hmm, That's my opinion. Oh, 100%. And and people say all the time, you know, we actually have a a program for the betrayer as well. It takes a certain kind of person who's willing to even do that program. Mm -hmm. But so often we'll hear from the betrayed, oh, but they're struggling with unhealed trauma and this and that. Well, you may be as well, but you didn't choose to betray. So while they have all of their stuff that needs to be cleaned up, whatever it was that led to it, there is no excuse for betrayal at all, ever. And you also said something about it being uh, so physical. It absolutely is. And that's why when people just say, oh, well, I'm in therapy, that's addressing things at one level. And it may or may not be helpful. We have a lot of people who come into the PBT Institute with therapy trauma uh, because when I go through the next discovery, you'll see how often if that person isn't highly skilled in betrayal, it does more harm than good. So want me to go through the third discovery? Not quite yet. I have one more question for you. You may or may not have the information at your fingertips. I'm curious how, what the proportion is of people who sign up who are betrayers compared to those who are betrayed. The reason I'm asking is oftentimes those who are the betrayers have, don't do it as a one-off. It is their way of life. They are somewhere, a lurking mental health disorder often that where they have something going on where they think it's okay. They're entitled to betray other people. They're entitled to act in ways that on one level they really know they oughtn't. So without getting into DSM diagnoses, could you tell us a little bit about that piece? Yeah, I, you know, it's it's so interesting because our rebuild program for the betrayers is actually pretty popular, but we don't attract that type of person that you're speaking of. Mm. This is the person who realizes I just I just shattered the heart and trust of the very person I love mm. the most that loves me the most. What in the world was I thinking? I am ready to do whatever it takes mm. to to make this right and to become someone I'm proud of. That's the person that this is for. So definitely not the person who's making excuses and blaming. And, and, you know, even if there is a bit of that, it's so interesting because just the other day, I I have a a group call with the betrayers once a month. And in fact, I thought it was going to be hard for me to do. I love it because these are people who take their healing so seriously. And there was a moment where one of our Rebuild members asked a question and said, I can't believe she's really uh, thinking of breaking up the family. And I stopped, it was a a husband and wife, and I stopped him right there. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. Your decisions cause the breakup of the family. What she is deciding to do about it is up to her. But when you made those choices, you were the one who broke up the family right there. So they don't get away with anything. (laughs) there's no shaming or blaming, but they're not getting away with any of it. And I think that brings to the forefront a big piece of the healing in betrayal, whether it's a, you know, betrayal like anything is on a spectrum from smaller to very significant. They're all betrayals, but it's interesting how personal accountability is a part of every single one. That if the individual who betrayed is not willing to step up and take accountability, 
take responsibility, go through the steps to apologize, which is minuscule. It's necessary, but you know, all of the rebuilding that comes after that. And so I'm glad you at your program attracts a portion of people who are willing to do that work to learn how to not betray other people. And of course, the betrayers also betraying themselves, which they often don't realize because when we betray others, we are betraying our own respect, integrity, all of those things. So do you know the proportion of the number of signups you get of betrayers versus betrayed? I would say we have to give a, a, a percentage, probably 60, 40, 60 or 65 wow. percent betrayed and 40 percent, 35 percent betrayers. That is quite high. And also the caliber of the person because it takes so much integrity mm -hmm. to reach out once you've betrayed to do the healing to really want to, as you said, become a better person, a person you can be proud of. So it's tremendous that your program is attracting people who really want to do that work. That's phenomenal. Oh, thank you. And it's also, we, we also attract a very different type of betrayed. This is not the person who's been betrayed. This is the person who is ready to heal from betrayal. Mm. It's a very different type of person. Ex I, I, for our listeners, I can see the difference, right? It's one is having been wounded. The other one is being ready to heal from those wounds. And people often aren't ready. They need time and they're not ready to, to do that. So explain for our listeners what you see in those two different categories. Oh my gosh. It's a, it's a very different population. One is it could be just too soon in their experience, but this is someone. And once I go through the third discovery, you will see them so clearly in my explanation, but just as a, as a brief thing, they, they have their story and they're sticking with it. And they can't imagine anything other than that. And they may be not ready. They're also many of them. And, and I'm saying this because I'm the recipient of their emails and messages, angry and bitter and resentful and, and all. And I get it. This is, I work with the most uh, untrusting niche there is for a good reason. So they're thinking, well, you know, I'm just another one of these people who's going to betray them or our whole community will betray them. And they've created a narrative around their story. And they also experience repeat betrayals. Mm. And it's just this one sort of mess of toxic soup that needs to be cleaned up if and when they're ready. And I love how you put that, that Sometimes when we are in a toxic soup, we have become so used to the toxic soup that we don't realize that it's toxic. It's like a putting a freshwater fish into, you know, salt water. It's not going to make it, but it may take it some time to realize, oh, this is, no, this isn't going to work. And sometimes that fish dies. Sometimes it finds a way <laughs> into, back into fresh water. And we want to be able to help our listeners understand that if you're not ready to heal from betrayal, doesn't mean that you're bad or wrong. It means that there's processing to do. I'm thinking of a time when I was betrayed tremendously. And thank goodness I had a good, you know, good support network around me and good collective. And I was doing some meditation and doing the loving kindness meditation. I, as I had been instructed because I was new to it, I was told that you first offer it to yourself. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be safe from inner and outer danger. May I be well in body, mind, and spirit. May I be truly happy and free. And the directions of this ancient meditation were first to offer it to yourself, then to offer it to your loved ones, and then to offer it to those who had betrayed you or the person. And the directions were very good because they said, if you cannot do it for the people who have betrayed you or person, it's okay. Just stop. And there will come a day where you will be able to offer that as sort of a way of forgiving them. And I will tell you, I tried for, I did it on my walks every morning for months. And one day I was able to offer that in full. And I felt so much lightness and release. Because often the person who is betrayed is holding on to this weight 
of anger and resentment and sadness. And the other people are going on with their lives. Often they don't even feel anything. And so you're carrying around this extra backpack of sadness, pain, resentment, grief, and all of that. And so when, and this is probably cutting to a piece you'll talk about later, but that piece of being able to let go of that weight when you, and you can't push it. You can't say, oh, I just forgive them if you're not ready. And forgiveness also, people often think forgiveness means that you're opening the door Mm -hmm. to having the betrayal happen again. And no, 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 no. You could have very strong boundaries. You can never let those people or that person into your life again and still forgive them. So you release yourself from that pain, from that heavy load. What do you think of that? Well, uh, the PBT Institute founded National Forgiveness Day (laughs) around those, those concepts every September 1st. So absolutely. You know, you mentioned the just carrying that weight. Those are the symptoms of post-betrayal syndrome. Mm-hmm. That's what we carry when we're walking around with this. And you know, then we wind up numbing and medicating those symptoms and we stay in this very painful space. But you're right. When it comes to forgiveness, it's for us. It has nothing to do with the other person. Having said that, when we forgive too early, it backfires every time. When we're forgiving because we're just in so much pain, we just want this over with. No. And I remember reading um, a study that said, if you feel safe and valued and you forgive, you feel better. If you feel, if you do not feel safe and valued and you forgive, you feel worse. And when I wrote trust again, I kicked it up a notch and I said, let's exchange the word forgive for rebuild or reconcile, because I believe we should forgive anyway for our sake. Mm-hmm. And if you exchanged it, it would sound like this. If you feel safe and valued and you rebuild, you feel better. If you do not feel safe and valued and you rebuild, you feel worse. And that's true. When it comes to rebuilding or reconciling, that has so much to do with that other person. Because if they're unwilling to do the work, if they're unwilling to change, what are you signing up for again? Think about it. Absolutely. And that is a core piece of every relationship. I'm a firm believer in the fact that it, whether the relationship is two or three or four, however many people are in that You need all people to be willing to want to evolve and grow and rebuild. And if everyone's not on board, it will be very precarious going and often just repeat trauma, you know, trauma after trauma after trauma. And I do not take the word trauma lightly. We often use, oh, you know, I didn't get the color of, you know, fingernail polish I wanted. I'm traumatized. No, 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 no. That's, you know an odd use of the word trauma, we really want to be able to look at it as this very significant impact to the body, the mind, and the spirit. And betrayal does that on all levels. In fact, many people who are, I found this in my work, who are betrayed, they, you know, we understand the emotional component. We understand the mental component. We understand often the spiritual component. We feel if we have a connection to a divine, we feel like the divine has betrayed us and that the universe is not walking, watching out for us, that sort of thing. And then on the physical level, people can often walk into a room, a kitchen, somewhere where they learned of the betrayal and the body remembers. It will remember that conversation at the kitchen counter or in the bedroom or in the office. And that is where the body is storing. It is storing it in various areas, the gut, the heart. And so that connects back to the part where when you were giving us the statistics, of course, it makes sense that sleep issues arise, that GI issues arise, neck pain, back pain, all sorts of things. Yeah, trauma is a big earthquake, the body, mind, and spirit. For sure. And the good news is you can heal from all of it. And that was the third discovery. The third, we're ready. Okay. Yeah. And it was while we can stay stuck for years, decades, a lifetime, and so many people do, if we're going to fully heal, and by fully heal, I mean those symptoms of post-betrayal syndrome, like I just shared, that I just shared, to this completely rebuilt place called post-betrayal transformation, we're going to move through five proven predictable stages. And what's even more exciting about that is we know what happens physically, mentally, and emotionally at every stage. And we know what we need to do in order to move from one stage to the next. Healing is entirely predictable. And I'm happy to share the stages. Please do. 
It's all we do within the PBT Institute. It's what all of our coaches are certified in. Here's a, uh, a distilled version. Okay. So stage one is before it happens. And if you can imagine four legs of a table, the four legs being physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. What I saw with everybody, me too, was this heavy lean on the physical and the mental thinking and doing, right? We're so good at that and kind of neglecting or ignoring the emotional and the spiritual feeling and being. Well, if a table only has two legs, it's easy for that table to topple over. That's us. Stage two, shock, trauma, D-Day, discovery day. This is the scariest of all of the stages. And everybody remembers their D-Day because it made such an impact on us at that time. And it's the breakdown of the body, the mind, and the worldview. So right here, you've ignited the stress response. You are now headed for every single stress-related symptom, illness, condition, disease. Your mind is in a complete state of chaos and overwhelm. You cannot wrap your mind around what you just learned, right? This makes no sense. Like the initial caller who said about their siblings. Yes. You know, it's a, you're shocked. You're like, what? And your worldview has just been shattered. Your mm-hmm. worldview is your mental model, the rules that govern you, that prevent chaos. Trust this person. Don't go there, right? These are the rules. And in one earth shattering moment or series of moments, every yes. rule you've been holding to be real and true is no longer the bottom has bottomed out on you and a new bottom hasn't been formed yet. This is terrifying, but think about it. If the bottom were to, this was the sense of safety and security that you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier. If the bottom were to bottom out on you, what would you do? You'd grab hold of anything or anyone in order to stay safe and stay alive. That's stage three, survival instincts emerge. This is the most practical out of all of the stages. If you can't help me, get out of my way. How do I survive this? Where do I go? Who can I trust? But this is the trap though. Stage three by far is the most common place we get stuck. We talked about this earlier, that person who's just in that sort of toxic soup, right? Mm -hmm. This we're stuck here because once we've figured out how to survive our experience, because it feels so much better than the shock and trauma of where we just came from, we think it's good. And because we don't know there's anywhere else to go, we don't know there's a stage four or stage five, transformation doesn't even begin until stage four. But because we don't know there's anywhere else to go, we plant roots here. We're not supposed to, but we don't know that. And four things happen. The first thing is we start getting all these small self-benefits, secondary gain. We get to be right. We get our story. We love our story. We get sympathy from everyone we tell our story to. On and on. We get so many benefits. So on some level, we don't feel we're getting much else. We take it. Mm -hmm. So we plant deeper roots. And now, because we're here a while, the mind starts doing things like, you know, maybe you're not that great. Maybe you deserved it. Maybe this, maybe that. So we plant deeper roots. Again, we're not supposed to be here, but we don't know. And now because these are the thoughts we're thinking, this is the energy we're putting out. Like energy attracts like energy. So now we're attracting people and circumstances and relationships to confirm this is where we belong. This is where we join that lame support group and we will actually sabotage our healing because we found our people, right? And this is where we may be healing and we will sabotage our healing because we're afraid to outgrow that betrayer who won't change. So this is, and then we get all those symptoms of post-betrayal syndrome. Now we start medicating and suppressing the symptoms. And this is, this is where we're, we're at. It gets worse, but I'll get you out of here. Because it feels so bad, but we don't know there's anywhere else to go. We don't like where we're at. So we try to numb, avoid, and distract. So right here, we start using food, drugs, alcohol, work, TV, whatever, to numb, avoid, and distract ourselves. So think about it. We do it for a day, a week, a month. Now it's a habit, a year, 10 years, 20 years. And I can see someone 20 years later and say, that emotional eating you're doing mm-hmm. or that drinking, do you think that has anything to do with your betrayal? And they'd look at me like I'm crazy. And they would say it happened 20 years ago. All they did was put themselves in stage three and stay there. Does that feel it? Absolutely. That goes back to the piece we were talking about earlier where it's, unaddressed. It's put in this time capsule is how I look at it. And I talk about it in my books, this time capsule where you think you've come somewhere because you're surviving, Mm -hmm. but the pain is sealed off 
And when we seal off the pain, when we seal off the memories and the, and sometimes the memories are still there, but we've encapsulated around this kind of armor and thus we're preventing the growth. Exactly. And that's why we think, okay, we're, we're good. We're okay here. But if you notice, we're not, our health isn't great. Our relationships aren't great. Our work isn't great. We're at sort of a standstill. Anyway, if we're willing, willingness is a huge word right here. If we are willing to grieve, mourn the loss, do a bunch of things, we move to stage four. Stage four is finding and adjusting to a new normal. So here's where you acknowledge, I can't undo what happened, but I control what I do with it. That decision right there starts turning down the stress response. You're not healing just yet, but at least you stop the massive damage that had been going on in stages two and mm -hmm. stage three. Stage four feels like, it's like this feeling of kind of hopeful excitement. You know, it feels like if you've ever moved, if you've ever moved to a new house, office, whatever, all your stuff's not there. It's not quite cozy yet, but you're like, we can do this. We got this. It feels like that. But there was something so interesting I noticed. There's this one spot as we move from stage three to stage four, where if your friends weren't there for you, we don't take them with you. That lame support group, you're done. That betrayer who's not changing, you're done. And think about it. If you were to move to a new place, you don't take everything with you. You don't take those things that don't represent the version of you you're now ready to become. So really common to outgrow uh, certain friendships and relationships in this one spot. Anyway, when we've settled into this new space, we've made it cozy, we've made it kind of mentally home, we move into the fifth most beautiful stage. And this is healing, rebirth, and a new worldview. The body starts to heal. Self-love, self-care, eating well, exercise. We didn't have the bandwidth of that earlier. We were, you know, we were healing. Now we do. The mind is healing. New rules, new boundaries based on the road we just traveled and a new worldview based on everything we see so clearly now. And the four legs of the table. In the beginning, it was all about the physical and the mental. By this point, we're solidly grounded because we're focused on the emotional and the spiritual too. Those are the five stages. It's a beautiful template, and I love how you've laid it out so clearly that we can follow how you can move through and really think you're healed by the time you're at stage three. And I love how you, I, I am a big fan of support groups and well-run support groups, but sometimes we mistake a support group for a place where we are patting each other on the back and consoling each other and validating where we are, which sometimes isn't really, we want to often move beyond that space into freedom, emotional freedom, mental freedom, physical freedom. And so as much as it can be, you know, important to be a part of that tribe, that tribe of people who's been betrayed, we do want to have the energy to move beyond that label into a place where, yes, we were betrayed, but now we don't identify with it as strongly. It's not our, our way of being anymore. We are in that post-betrayal group, that group of, hey, I'm an amazing individual. I have solid boundaries. I don't deserve to be betrayed. I'm going to draw relationships to me where there is respect, there is compassion, empathy, integrity, all of those things. And if you're not part of that tribe, okay, you know, I have a nice boundary around that. And I think that growth-oriented mentality is what can then, instead of the pain carrying us forward, the growth begins to carry us forward. And we have used that betrayal as a means to almost like that grain of sand inside you know, the oyster where the grain of sand allows us to grow and grow and coat and coat, not in just a purely protective way, but in a beautiful transformative way that allows us to just be come out the other side truly transformed. I love the way you offer the stages, Dr. Debbie. It's just beautiful. Thank you so much. It's, uh, <laughs> what's it's so exciting about it is that there's a roadmap now. So you simply have to know where you are. And then it's the stages to, it's the steps to move forward. And we even have, it's this beautiful, along with our signature program within the community, a milestones and markers. And 
members get such a thrill out of checking off, oh, wow, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that. And this sense of accomplishment and completion as they fully and truly leave a stage and they're ready for the next. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful and so necessary, not just for the person who was betrayed, but for anyone you're in contact with, your kids, whether they're little kiddos or adult kiddos, for people in your world to see you as a role model of someone who didn't get ruined, didn't become jaded because of betrayal. So let's take it back to our listener's question of, of the day, the one whose family, the sibling, the, the sister and the brother who betrayed her for money. And it sounds like there maybe wasn't much of it, but whatever it was, would you have any specific tips or pointers for her when it comes to, she sounds very lonely, bereft. I don't know if she has a partner, kiddos, not. Any specific thoughts for her to guide her in her healing journey, other than looking at your website? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. You know, I would say, first of all, this is a mantra you want to repeat a million times if you need to, even though it happened to you, it's not about you. And that's so important to realize that this isn't about you. Unfortunately, we're not in control of other people's behaviors. So what you want to do is look at it and, and use this to your advantage. Acknowledge that pain. It is so deeply painful. But when you realize that people are acting from their current place of consciousness, this is the best they thought they could do at the time. And if and when it's sometime in the future, they decide to change, they will. If not, don't let that impact your healing. You heal so that you move through that pain uh, and, and you, don't re you don't think this is, this is me. It is so deeply painful though, but it's not you. You know, I remember when it came to my family, this is going to sound so odd, but it'll help. When they were, it was, it was example after example, after example of consistent behavior. And I, I, I always had a lots of, lots of dogs. We had six at one time. And I remember looking at all of them saying, you know, they're dogs. I mean, I love them dearly. They're dogs, but I never expect them to act anything other than dogs. That's who they are. Why am I expecting people who have consistently shown a certain behavior to act differently? That's on me. And there was something about that that was in such a silly way, so freeing and so liberating. So to this wonderful person who is struggling so deeply, I send my heart, I send my love, I, I get it, I get it. But it's not about you. It is not about you. Yes, and I would imagine if she looks back, she will see indicators and it's hindsight is always so much easier for all of us because when we're in it, we often miss the red flags. We often miss the money hungry, plotting, you know, partner or sibling or whatever it is. Yes. I'd love to add to that too. People always get so angry. How did I not see? How did I not know? And I, I, I would recommend they reframe that. You couldn't see, you couldn't know because you don't know how to think that way. And that's a good thing. Yes, I am a firm believer. Manipulators, predators, they're doing it as a way of life. They don't, but for someone who's not good at it, they wouldn't know to be looking for it because they're entering the world thinking, oh, well, I'm honesty based, trust based. Exactly. I'm, and everyone else plays by those rules. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't mm -hmm. they? And the manipulator and predator be like, ah, you should be smarter. You should have caught on to it. Well, no, because if you're, if you haven't raised yourself, to be a manipulative, disingenuous person, it, and you don't want to be that way. And even if you want to be that way in the world, it generally can't be cultivated. You can't make yourself from a kind, trusting individual, or you wouldn't want to have to adjust that kind, gentle nature into something that you're not, just to simply what, ward off the manipulators and predators out there. So it's more about learning to be aware of the red flag behaviors, which is one of the sad benefits of having been betrayed is now you can recognize that particular bird call, right? Now yeah. you're like, oh, okay, I can identify it. It's a, that's what I'm dealing with. And to not second guess yourself and think again, like you said, it's not about this person. It's not her. It is the, as you were saying, the dogs in the family being the dogs. They're just being, 
and that's unkind to our pet dogs because um, we love our pet dogs, but sometimes the people who are betrayers, mm, no, they're exactly. not in that category. So, yeah. oh, well, thank you, Dr. Debbie. I so appreciate all of your wisdom and your support for our listeners. Where can our listeners find you? Uh, thank you. Everything is at the PBT, as in post betrayal transformation, the PBT Institute.com. All right, listeners, you will be able to find Dr. Debbie's information links in the show notes. So it's Dr. Debbie Silber, S-I-L-B-E-R, at the pbtinstitute.com. It's a great website. Thanks again, Dr. Debbie, for sharing your time and wisdom with us today. I'm so grateful. And thank you to our listeners. This is Imperfect Love. Thanks so much for sharing your time with me today. Remember, you have the power to transform your life and love fearlessly, if imperfectly. And it's my privilege to help you along the way. You can find more life-changing content, including my books and other podcast episodes, at drcarlamanley.com. Feel free to submit your own confidential questions through my website. I'll do my very best to include your issue on a future episode. If you found this podcast helpful, please subscribe and leave a review. Until we connect again, This is Dr. Carla Marie Manley wishing you oceans of blessings and love. Please note, this podcast is psychoeducational in nature and is not intended to replace formal mental health support. Please contact your health care provider or emergency hotline if you need psychiatric care. And as always, please take good care of your amazing, wonderful self.